I had one experience in Germany when we were flying in the hilly country where there was a house on the top of a hill and we were flying up the valley and we were slightly lower than the house. When the door opened and a man stepped out and with a great shock saw me looking at him from about 40 feet. And that was a one-off experience. <laughs> During World War II, Adolf Hitler and Germany strangled humanity. And all of Europe was his prison. But sometimes, mission, man, and machine merge to produce a sudden stroke of liberation from tyranny. The machine was the Mosquito attack aircraft. The man was Ted Sismore, master navigator in England's Royal Air Force. And the mission was the destruction of Gestapo headquarters in Shell House, Copenhagen, Denmark. The German war machine subjugated almost all of Europe. But Nazi brutality triggered the rise of resistance movements in many countries. Denmark produced a fierce and effective resistance, and its fighters became a serious challenge to the German occupiers. The center of evil for the Danish resistance movement was this building, Shell House, Gestapo headquarters in Copenhagen. The Gestapo people had been very active indeed. Uh, they had been successful in arresting some key people and had, through torture and through maltreatment of those people they had arrested, been able to get hold of a very important part of the resistance movement. It was a house of terror and torture, a place of surveillance where files of evidence were kept on Danish resistance workers. And to deter British RAF raids on Shell House, the Germans imprisoned resistance leaders as hostages in cells in the attic of the building. It wasn't just a task of destroying the building, but if possible, to ensure that the people in the sixth floor were not killed and had a chance of escape. The operation was regarded as one of the most dangerous operations in World War II. Success of the mission depended on a pinpoint attack, signaling out one building in a crowded modern city. The man chosen to lead the attack, find the path from England to Shell House, was Ted Sismore, master navigator of the mission. Today, he lives in a small village north of London. When I was still at school, we could see Germany building up. We could see Hitler being a problem. Um, Schoolboys talked a lot about it. And it's silly to say this, uh, to remember this now, but it's true. We used to say we were afraid the war would come too soon and we wouldn't be old enough to get into it. I joined the RAF Volunteer Reserve in August 1939. Our first contact with the Danish resistance was when we were shown some information about the Gestapo headquarters. The Danes were getting worried about the amount of information the Gestapo had put together on the underground movement. By the end of February 1945, resistance leader Ole Lippmann sent a secret signal to London to bomb Shell House in order to destroy Gestapo headquarters in Copenhagen. I came to the conclusion that irrespective of the risks, irrespective of the fact that a lot of close friends and people I knew were sitting on top of the Shell House, plus both the houses next to the Shell House and the school on the other side would be hit. Uh, I came home to Copenhagen uh, with the opinion that we had to ask for help. 
and we were asked to go up to SOE headquarters in Baker Street in London. And they said, can you attack the Gestapo headquarters in Copenhagen? I must admit, the first reaction was not possible to pick out one building in a city. And then we looked very carefully at all the information that they provided, photographs, diagrams, maps, and realized that there was just one possible approach to Shell House, which could be successful. And so after some deliberation, we said, yes, we thought we could do it, knowing that it would be difficult. But the problem, of course, was that we were told about the Danes up in the attic. And we said, there isn't any way we can attack this building and protect the Danes in the attic. We are going likely to kill them all. That was the biggest worry at that phase of the operation. The feelings, really, all, all the prisoners, that all knew that it was necessary, all expected the raid to come, all knew that if they don't raid it now, they have so much material that they can practically arrest the whole resistance movement in Copenhagen. The Mosquito was a breakthrough attack aircraft that had extraordinary speed and maneuverability. It was made almost entirely of wood, the wooden wonder as it became known. The first time I ever heard about the Mosquito, I was in a troop ship in Gibraltar Harbor. And this, this story came around that the Havilands were building a wooden bomber which was going to be exceptional. The Mosquito gave the British a versatile weapon for low-level operations. Much faster, much more nimble, and more threatening to German control of the air. It's incredible this aeroplane lives up to its reputation. I mean, it was supposed to be very fast and very maneuverable. Well, within five minutes of getting airborne in it, you knew that was true. It was fast and it was maneuverable. And so I decided that's where I wanted to be. Like the rest of Europe, the prisoners in the Shell House attic waited and hoped for freedom. They included leaders of the resistance movement, resistance fighters, and high public figures of the Danish government. The Germans had assembled a human shield against potential RAF attack. We started to make a relief model of the target, of an area of about, I suppose, a kilometer square around the target. Oh, the, the, the information we were given by the Danes was, was absolutely vital. We had Sven Trulsen, who was our appointed liaison officer. I said, uh, quite casually, it's a pity someone didn't stand on this bridge and take a photograph up here. Oh, he requested uh, a photo which shows the shell house exactly in the way the pilots would see it when they were running into target. Not very long afterwards, he appeared in my office with a photograph and said, will that do? And he had arranged for this particular photograph to be taken and for it to be flown out and was produced to me. And I said, well, now you've given me the, the last bit of information, I can't possibly allow myself to fail, can I? <laughs> the key to the whole attack really was that the only open approach to the front of this building was across the water, which of course gave us an open flat approach. And of course we set the model up so that all the crews could look at it and of course to see it from the line we were having, you have to get down and look at it. You've got to be down here. This is the kind of visual approach that one had, where you can see the targets and you can pick out the uh, spires and the things which really matter. Of course, the building was, was the only building, as far as I can remember, that was camouflaged. It didn't make it easy to find it, but it did confirm when we got close that it was the right building we were aiming for. The problem with all these targets always was how many bombs do we need to do the job without over, overplaying it, without having too many crews involved. And in this case, we selected 
18 mosquitoes flying in three waves of six and all carrying 11 second delay bombs so that the first aircraft could be clear before the second wave appeared. We would arrive over the target at 20 past 11. That was the time when all the Gestapo would be at work in their, their offices, which would help us to enable to help us to destroy the records because all their safes would be open, their papers would be on the tables and so on. And also we would kill the greatest number of Gestapo. The final operational plans for the raid, codenamed Carthage, were completed. At RAF First Field, 18 Mosquito bombers and 28 Mustang fighter escort aircraft were assembled, poised for the mission. But the North Sea route to Copenhagen was lashed with turbulent weather, gale force winds and rain. Well, I had been uh, in the operations room pretty well all night, actually and had been on the telephone to two group headquarters about the weather and various aspects like that. Um, the weather was not good. We knew that it was going to be difficult. It was windy, it was rough. Finally, on the morning of March 21st, 1945, the weather conditions improved, and one of the most daring raids of World War II was underway at last. We flew over the sea at 50 feet, all the way, just to make sure we didn't get picked up by any radar. Not only did it keep us out of radar, it kept us out of the line of sight of light AGAC guns. The pilot was having uh, quite a problem, and I, as the navigator then, was having uh, an equal problem because it was difficult to sit still. You couldn't hold the map still, and you certainly couldn't write. And so we had a combination of bumps. It was difficult to steer the course, it was difficult to see. We had salt on the windscreen. The difficulty in approaching the Danish coast, of course, is that it's very flat and therefore difficult to identify from 50 feet. But fortunately, you have a number of very distinctive uh, lighthouses along the coast. We were able to identify the lighthouses which were within visual distance without too much trouble. The aircraft swept over the Danish countryside at rooftop level. One mosquito bomber flew through the drifting smoke of a cottage chimney. We were below treetop height. And it was the most impressive ride in as far as Copenhagen. I'll never forget it. The, the fields looked beautifully green. and uh, all, the, all the chaps working in the fields were rushed away. They were waving and they, were, they had to hold their horses. They were plowing by horses. They were holding their horses and coming to attention and saluting. And, and they were tremendously excited. And it was very, very inspiring to, to, to see. To the people of Denmark, the sudden appearance of low-flying British aircraft represented the awakening of freedom. The sky was filled with hope, and those staring upward anticipated the lifting of the black shroud of brutal occupation. The target was difficult to find. The important thing was to uh, make sure that one was on the track line that we had drawn on the map, exactly. And I don't mean nearly, I mean exactly, because it meant that if we could stick on that line, the target would come up straight ahead. Um, fortunately, with the geography of Copenhagen, the line we had drawn was relatively easy to follow once we got onto it. We saw the target at a reasonable range and the camouflage was just confirmation that it was the right building. When we ran into the city of Copenhagen itself, some guns started firing but then I saw some guns which were not manned. And then, of course, 
We looked across to the, the harbour area and there was a German cruiser which was firing. It was pretty well standard drill uh, if you were attacking a building to release the bombs to try and strike somewhere close to the ground because remember we had 11-second uh, delay bombs, so the bombs were going to hit and be somewhere into the building before they actually exploded. So we wanted to get them in low down to have the maximum effect. Approximately three blocks from the target, people waved at the onrushing British aircraft. The mosquitoes literally streamed down the streets towards Shell House and then pounded the lower floors of the building with explosives and incendiaries. The attacking aircraft aimed or skipped their bombs towards the lowest levels of Shell House. A tactic that provided precious minutes for the hostages and resistance fighters to escape down adjoining staircases. But then we went down the staircase and then we could see across the yard, we could see that another part of the, of the building uh, was destroyed for the upper floors and we sort of our comrades who were there, of course. When we came to the lowest part of the staircase, there were so many dead people and Indian people uh, that you could not avoid stepping on them. And that stopped me, and I stood waiting at the balustrade, and folk came from behind and knocked me on my shoulder and said, get on, Ray Bobby, how to get on? At the time of the raid, Paul Borking, parachutist and SOE agent, was being interrogated on the fifth floor. In the morning, you will be shot. Borking saw the mosquitoes over the interrogator's shoulder. He leapt to his feet, overturned the table, ran from the room, and escaped to freedom. The first time when I got really scared was when Mr. Shark and Foe, Kampman and I, we four, at the same time, we were running away from the building over about between 50 or 100 meter open space. And I was a, thought, now they will start shooting you in your back. But nothing happened. Shell House was destroyed, as was the largest store of Gestapo records in Denmark. And many of the attic prisoners escaped. But there was a heartbreaking, tragic consequence to the raid. An accidental bombing of the nearby Jean d'Arc school, resulting in the deaths of 86 children and 13 adults. Since the objective of the raid was to destroy the documentation, the raid was totally 100% successful. I mean, the, the, the destruction, uh, the building caught fire in a big way, and uh, I'm sure all the documentation was lost. So 100% success. Then you have to balance it with the losses. Some of the Danes in the roof were killed. All those children were killed. Um, how can you balance it? There's no question that the aircraft crash of Peter Klebo actually clipped a tower on the railway, and that caused the accident. He crashed close to the school. The, the smoke from the fire clearly hid the target from the people coming up behind, and somebody accidentally, because of the smoke, released the bombs early and they went into the school. The most terrible tragedy. There's little doubt, though, that had all the bombs gone into the target, it's most likely that most of the Danes in the attic would have been killed. The loss of the children was, was very dramatic. It, 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 affected us very much. 
We were up there in, De in Copenhagen, uh, oh, only weeks really later, when we went up with a small team as guests of the new government, just after the war ended. And we went to the school, and Basil Embry laid a wreath in the school. And we met the parents of the children that were killed. And I shall never forget it. They were, they all said the same thing. We do understand. I don't know how they could. Edward Ted Sismore, master navigator of the Shell House raid, rose to the rank of Air Commodore before retiring in 1976. After the war, he also became a pilot. Denmark awarded him the Order of the Dannenbro. Shell House was completely destroyed, along with vital Gestapo records and information. The attack on Shell House lasted approximately four minutes. Many members of the Gestapo were killed. Most of the Danish resistance fighters imprisoned in the attic escaped. The Royal Air Force lost 10 airmen, four Mosquito bombers, and two Mustang fighters. The British raid on the Shell House helped destroy the power of the Gestapo in Denmark and allowed the Danish resistance to continue the fight for freedom. When the war ended, I said, I've finished killing. Because I wouldn't go shooting. I wouldn't go shooting game or anything, because I said, I've killed enough people. <laughs>